So this was the talk that I was assigned, so that's, and I'm going to try to do this uh, and get, it, get us right back on schedule, right? Um, so pharmacogenetics is what, uh, is one of the things that I do, and there are two ways in which people think about pharmacogenetics in general. One is this idea of rare, serious, adverse drug reactions that everybody thinks, you know, they come out of the blue and therefore must have a genetic basis. And, and the other problem is that, is that clinical response to virtually any drug that we ever use is characterized by striking uh, variability in efficacy. So these are data on, uh, from, from, from two sites in the pharmacogenetics research network looking at response to simvastatin and response to an antihypertensive. And you can see that most people are at the average, at or around the average. And there's always a little bit of, there's always some people who are way, of, way away from average. So the question is, why are some people up here and some people down here? Most people are in the middle, and I'll come back to that over and over again. So the notion of studying pharmacogenetics, understanding the genetic basis of variability in response to drugs is, is what the Pharmacogenetics Research Network is all about. So the Pharmacogenetics Research Network has been in existence since 2000. This is the current uh, makeup of the network. There are 14 clinical sites, and there are a couple of other sites that do network-wide kinds of things, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you that in, uh, about that in the next slide. This is the structure. These are the 14 sites around the, uh, around the outside, and I'm not going to tell you uh, what they are. You can read them if you want, or you can look on the web later, but they cover uh, a, a range of disciplines, neuropsychiatry, implementation, cardiovascular oncology, uh, endocrine and inflammation. Um, the, uh, the, the network uh, is also it consists of working groups um, and, uh, and uh, has taken on for itself the idea of organizing uh, national and international consortia to study specific drug responses. So this is the International Warfarin Pharmacogenetics Consortium uh, and uh, CPIC I'll talk about a little bit and I'll say a word about PharmGKB in a second. In the last cycle of the network, uh, one of the things that Mark Rutain and Kathy Giacomini uh, spearheaded was an alliance with the Genomic Medicine Working Group at, uh, at Yokohama, led at the time by Yusuke Nakamura, who's now at University of Chicago with, with Mark. And the notion was that we would uh, uh, bring to the, uh, the, the Japanese group proposals for genome-wide association studies for drug response phenotypes, and they would to undertake for themselves, at, at their own cost, the, the genotyping that was involved. There are about, there are over 20 projects that have been done. It's a little slow to get the data out the other end because there's replication involved and that sort of thing. They're in, very much involved in scientific partners, and that's been a really great uh, asset to the network. So in the current iteration of the network, the idea was to create network-wide resources that would be accessible to network investigators uh, for, uh, for a variety of uses, and that's what the network looks like now. There's a statistical core, there's a next generation sequencing core, there's ontology cores, and there's a, a, an EMR core that we're involved with or that we direct. PharmGKB was an ori originally a, a site for the, for the network, but has since sort of spun off on its own. It's the pharmacogenetics knowledge base, and their goal in life is to accrue data on the relationship between drugs and genes and uh, variability in drug responses, and this is the, a screenshot from their uh, front page. And they've been enablers for some of the international consortia work that we've uh, undertaken. So uh, I'm fond of this slide. It, it appeared in The New Yorker in 2000 when the when the, when the famous press conference occurred in the, uh, in the White House announcing that the first human genome draft had been completed. And uh, I'm fond of saying when I show this that uh, we, all, we all look to this vision, don't think it's going to be on paper. And, I, and, I, and, and it's interesting that, that she's handing her prescription not to a physician but to a pharmacist. So it, it, it reinforces this idea of... Uh, of implementation science, at least, or, or delivery of genomic information as a team sport. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is uh, here. I'm going to talk about our PREDICT program, which is our, our toe in the water for implementation and, and serves as a model for some of the other things that are going on in PGRN and then this alliance between PGRN and the eMERGE network that you heard about yesterday, and I'll tell you a little bit more about. Um, 
in terms of a pharmacogenomics implementation project. So PREDICT was an idea uh, that grew out of uh, a mandate from our leadership to, uh, to, to people like me and, and the, uh, the leads in informatics to develop a system that would deliver pharmacogenomic variant data within the electronic medical record system at Vanderbilt. We started planning in the fall of 2009 and started implementing in the fall of 2010. This is the front of one of our brochures. So the notion is you select populations who are at risk for receiving a drug that has some actionable pharmacogenomic story. There are, and the, and the way we define that is a drug that has something in its FDA label, basically. Um, and I'll tell you how we've gone about identifying people at risk in a second. The genotype them not for the drug that you think they're going to get, but for uh, on a multiplex platform that assays many genotypes for many drug responses. Uh, and then you archive the data, you pull out the genotypes that you think are important, display them in the electronic medical record, develop decision support tools, track what happens when those decision support tools fire. I call that the easy stuff. Oh, yeah. Right. It is the easy stuff. So while we were planning, the FDA did us a favor, and that is that they changed the label for clopidogrel, one of the most widely used drugs in medicine at the time. And they changed the label to reflect the fact that clopidogrel is a prodrug, requires bioactivation through multiple pathways, primarily CYP2C19. There is a common variant in CYP2C19 with a minor allele frequency of somewhere around 20%, about 2% of the population are homozygotes. I'll show you data on that in a second. And the, the variant is a loss of function variant. It's a clear, it's a clear loss of function variant. So uh, consider alternate treatments or treatment strategies in patients identified as CYP2C19 per metabolizers. That, that set the cardiology world sort of aflame. They, they hated this idea because their, their sense was that there hadn't been a randomized clinical trial showing that there should be alternate strategies. Uh, the FDA stance was, well, we know enough about the biology to say that this drug doesn't get bioactivated, so it's not going to work in treating people with, with, who are homozygote poor metabolizers with this drug is like treating them with placebo. So, uh, and that's the tension that we all feel in pharmacogenetics implementation in a nutshell. So we have been implementing since September 2010. These are numbers that are about a month old now. And this is what happens when you look at 12,521 subjects. There are 2.7% that are homozygotes, 18.9% that are heterozygotes, 66% have no common variant, and 12% have something else that we don't know what to do with and we don't deliver any advice. The only ones we deliver advice about are these two here. This is easy if you think it's only star two, but it gets a little complicated, and this is important because this is sort of where the, the sort of rubber meets the road, the blood and guts of these kinds of things. There are other variants that we have to take into account, uh, and so we call people who are hypometabolizers, these are the 334, mostly star two, star two, but there are other variants. This is star two, star two. So there are other variants that can contribute to this, uh, what we term the homozygote poor metabolizer. So that we have decision support. This is what the decision support looks like. I'm fond of showing this and saying, if you see a typo on this, don't tell me about it because it's been through the pharmacy committee, it's been through the genetics committees, it's been through the informatics committees, it's been through the legal committee, and it's been through the pharmacy and therapeutics committee, which is the last gatekeeper to the way we use drugs at our place, just like everywhere else. And, and if there's a typo, I just don't want to know about it. Um, this is, uh, we're not the only ones that are doing this, as I'll, as I'll tell you about in a moment. The University of Maryland and other places are doing it, have developed their own decision support, uh, and this is what theirs looks like, so very, very similar. Ours is prettier, but it, it says the same thing. Um, so this is, the, this is the slide that I wasn't sure I wanted to show, um, because it is a little bit uh, early for this, but Josh Peterson, one of the People at our place has been looking a lot at outcomes, and, and this is what happens when you take 7,500 PREDICT patients and ask the question, what happens when they get clopidogrel? Now, only 1,600 of them got clopidogrel, and the reason for that will become clear in a moment, but bear with me for a second. So you, 1,620 get a stent, and then we looked at what happens at 90 days. So if you're a normal metabolizer, the chances are that you end up on clopidogrel, a cheap, effective drug. If you're a poor metabolizer, that's the 2.7%, the chances are about 50-50, and we think the, this is a hard number to come up with because uh, it's probably more like 70-30 that you're on an alternate therapy. The, the reasons that it's not 100% are 
There are lots of reasons why that is. If somebody wants to know what they are, I can tell you about them. But it has to do with contraindications to drugs, and it has to do with physicians not listening to advice and those kinds of things. And what's very, very cool for me is that there's a gene dose effect. So if you're an intermediate metabolizer, doctors are smart enough to know that the evidence is a little mushier, <laughs> and so some of them convert to something else, and some of them don't. So there's a very nice gene dose effect. So that's, that's, our, that's our first look at outcomes. Dan, on the, uh, for the intermediate, uh, do you have any signal related to the recommendations that some have made about doubling clopidogrel dose? Uh, we're looking at that right now. I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a great question. It doesn't work. Supposedly. Uh, there's a publication out there. Well, quadrupling might work. That's the sort of the, the 300 instead of 75. It's, yeah. it's a, a, you know, I don't want to go there. <laughs> Um, so this is the way that our electronic medical record looks right now. I'm fond of showing this slide because, you know, I've blacked out all the identifiers except, except this one, just to make sure you know that I, I do see patients and this is one of mine. Um, and and, and I, I wouldn't say that it's the prettiest way of displaying it, but we display now five drug gene, what we call drug gene pairs, clopidogrel, warfarin, simvastatin, thiopurines, and tecolimus. And, and this is the medicines that this person is on. They actually, the list goes down further. What's very cool is, th is this particular patient has a variant in CYP2C9, which would make them, which would make you predict that they would lead, need less warfarin. And in fact, they, they take four milligrams on one day and three milligrams a day the other day. So that's, that is an unusually low dose, and that's probably why. So how did we get from one drug to, to five drugs? Um, I'll, I'll tell you about that in a second. But this is what happens when you start to do multiplex testing. So you you now, it's the same population of patients, but now we can look at the, remember, we, we do the genotyping on this uh, uniform platform, and we pull out the genetic variants as, as the PNT committee says to us to pull them out. And um, only 11.8% of people have no variants. And I think, you know, obviously, this is pretty obvious. You know, the more, the more, you, the more you look at, the more likely it is that somebody's going to have a variant. So at the end of the day, this is the argument for multiplexing the, the testing, because <clears throat> if, you, if you did it one test at a time, you're always going to have, mo it, it, the test won't benefit most people. If you do it 50 tests at a time, you're, I tell people, you're abnormal for something, you just don't know what it is, and so this is the way around that. So that's what we do. So another group that is at high risk uh, came out of this study. So we uh, used our informatics capabilities to find a, a cohort of about 50,000 people who make their medical home at Vanderbilt. They get all their care there, as near as we can tell. So how many over the course of five years received one of 58 drugs that include pharmacogenomic information in their label? The, surprise, the answer was a bit of a surprise. 65% got one medicine like that within five years. So we, uh, and when I say we, I don't mean me. I mean the guys who do the work, Josh Denny mainly developed a predictive algorithm that said, uh, is this patient, does this patient have characteristics that make them likely to get clopidogrel, simvastatin, or warfarin, those are the three big ones for us in the cardiovascular space at least, in the next five years. And, and so if you see a patient in your internal medicine, cardiology, nephrology, or diabetes clinic, the first thing you, if the first thing you see is this, then you click on that, you get this pop-up, and the pop-up will tell you this person has a calculated risk score of 68%, which means that they're a good candidate for getting this testing preemptively before they get exposed to any of these drugs. So this is, this is why we have 7,500 patients, not all of whom have been exposed to the drug, because some of them come into the program through this preemptive way, others come into the program through an indication way. So patient, people who are going to get a, who are going to the cath lab, uh, uh, they're tested. People who are scheduled for elective knee replacement who are going to end up on warfarin, they get tested. People who come into the children's hospital with acute leukemia, they get tested because they all have uh, indication specifics. Plus, there's this preemptive thing. So this is the way it looks right now. I, I, I wouldn't swear to these numbers here, but <clears throat> around 6,000 of the patients come in through this prognostic testing, and around 6,000 come in through this indication-based testing. This is where the number comes from. And what's interesting is that there are four drugs here. I haven't listed tacrolimus because that's just been added. And we would fire clinical decision support in 22% of the people on clopidogrel, 25% of the people on simvastatin, 100% on warfarin new starts, because we always give advice on what the dose should be, but only for the new starts, and then around 3% for thiopurines right now. Uh, this is complicated, but it sort of gives you a sense of what the flow looks like. Start down here. With, if you're the provider, there are two ways in which you get the testing. One is 
that um, a drug is, or you order a drug, and the, the system says, oh, this person has been genetically tested, uh, make sure that you uh, adjust the dose appropriately. That's one way the provider hears about it. The other way is that the provider sees that predict little stickum and orders the testing prognostically. In either case, the genotyping is on this Illumina platform. Most of the variants are sequestered. Bad word, I know, but there it is. And the actionable variants are delivered to the electronic health records. So that's about six or eight actionable variants right now. The other reason to show this is that um, we do engage patients, and there's a way that patients can actually see their own results. And, and the other part is up here, a lot of the work that has to go on before anything happens at all is an evidence uh, review, review by p and and other committees, and then development of the clinical decision support. St. Jude does it very much the same way. I'm fond of saying the two places that have the most advanced uh, preemptive programs like this in the country are both in the great state of Tennessee, or the state of Tennessee, anyway. Um, <laughs> so in, so Saint, what Mary Relling would tell you is that they looked at 4,000 patients uh, admitted to St. Jude, and about half of them will get exposed to at least one of a list that they have of 33 high-risk medications including a lot who get codeine or tramadol, and, and those are patients who are expected to have uh, high-risk diplotypes and uh, will need dose adjustment. And they have uh, clinical decision support of the type that we have. The, the mechanisms are a little bit different, but uh, the idea is the same. This is a TPMT genotype recommended before a drug is being given. Here is a person who has a CYP2D6 ultra-rapid metabolizer who's about to get codeine, so you have to be very careful with those. Those are the kinds of decision support that they've developed. So Mary has also uh, driven the development of CPIC, the Clinical Pharmacogenomics Implementation Consortium, in collaboration with the PGRN and, Pharma and, the, and PharmGKB, and it's now extended way beyond that. You heard from, has she gone? Mission Health? Where's she gone? The mission Health person has gone. She's not on that. She's confabbing. She's confabbing. So you heard that she's part of this as well. So uh, lots of institutions, lots of countries, and, and we have observers as well. So that's CPIC. I'll come back to what CPIC does, but Mary, um, Terry mentioned it yesterday as well and showed some of the publications. So um, one of the things that distinguishes the pharmacogenetics research networks is that there are 14 <coughs> sites, and each of them is funded to do their own pharmacogenetics stuff. And so creating networks, creating uh, inter-site synergies has been a challenge. And one of the ways in which we decided the last, uh, a couple of years ago when the last cycle started, was to create something called the Translational Pharmacogenomics Project that would, would bring together sites that were interested in implementation. And the, the overarching goal is to implement the CPIC guidelines into diverse real-world settings. So that's, the, that's, what it, that's, that's what the implementation part is. I, I'm going to talk a lot about implementation, but I just want to make sure that you, you remember that pharmacogenetics needs a lot of discovery as well. It's not just about implementation. How am I doing for time? So um, there are four aims, which I'll go through in a second. Uh, there are six sites in the original incarnation, and then there are two other sites that are about to be added, uh, including Mark's uh, site at the University of Chicago. And they interface with CPIC and with PharmGKB to develop educational tools, a toolbox of implementation solutions, and, uh, and some annotation that it turns out to be important for implementation. So CPIC, you heard about yesterday, lots and lots of guidelines. I stole these slides from Alan Schuldinger, who, developed, who directs the TPP, so they aren't all mine. So these are the guidelines that have been published, and there are many others that are in progress, including a bunch of updates to these guidelines, which are scheduled every two to three years. Um, these are the ones that are uh, coming, and, and updates are coming. The aim, two is implementation. So I, most sites are looking at CYP2C19 and clopidogrel. I, it says all sites, but I'll say most sites because we've added these two new sites. There are other, other implementations that are going on at various sites, and the, these are listed here. And there are two models. One is the targeted, you know, you sort of see a patient who's going to the cath lab, so you do CYP2C19 genotyping on them. That's uh, at the University of Maryland, and Mayo has projects in both spaces. And then we're doing this preemptive genotyping along with St. Jude, Ohio State, University of Florida, and Mayo is doing some of that as well. And Mark's program is sort of a hybrid, but mostly like this, mostly the preemptive program. Uh, these are some of the counts. You've already seen some of this. These are a little older, but University of Florida has some uh, data on CYP2C19. St. Jude has some data on TPMT, just to show you that many places are doing this. 
And then we have a, a, a very, very long list of uh, implementation metrics that we're, we're looking at. Um, so the lessons that were lear being learned, I, I think I will read you this slide just to say that it's a whole lot more complicated than, 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 than we would have thought, although anybody who thinks about it for a while would have realized how complicated it's going to be. You have to have institutional support. You have to have the leadership of the institution say, this is what we want to do, like at Mission Health, like at Vanderbilt, like at St. Jude. The, 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 the people at the top of the pyramid say, this is what we're going to be known for, and this is where we're going to invest. Um, the decision support is obviously important. The pr problem of education that sort of goes in a recurrent loop, you have to do it over and over and over again. And then as, you, as you're implementing, you have to watch what you're doing to see what's working and what's not working. <coughs> Aim three is to develop formats to report results to prescribers. As this business of star two, what does that really mean? And how do you translate a star two genetic result to something that is actionable or not? That's what this is all about. And then aim for is dissemination. So we've written a lot of papers, including this paper that sort of summarizes what we have done, we think. Um, so that leads me to the Emerge PGRN partnership. You, you heard something about Emerge yesterday. Emerge has great strengths in electronic phenotyping, in capturing large populations, in privacy science, and in other things that I've probably forgotten about. The Pharmacogenetics Research Network has this capability in developing drug gene guidelines in the CPIC and developing a platform, which I'm going to tell you about in a second, and thinking about CLIA, although we all think about CLIA. So there's this interaction between the two networks. The, the interaction starts with this platform. So, um, and this platform was not designed to be an implementation platform, but it's not a bad way of doing this, I think. So uh, when we develop this, we, we have this next generation sequencing capability within PGRN, and Debbie Nickerson and others said, well, you should, we should develop a, 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 an abbreviated list of important pharmacogenes that everybody's going to be interested in. Her vision was that everybody's going to genotype all their patients on, on this platform, so there'll be thousands and tens of thousands of people. I don't think that's going to happen, but it is being implemented in eMERGE. So each of the genes was nominated uh, by one of the PGRN sites. We had lots of balloting. The rules were every site got to have at least two of their favorite genes on the list, but we all had to agree that these were important pharmacogenes. So CYP2D6, for example, probably was nominated 14 times because it's an important pharmacogenes. And these are mainly what they are, metabolism transporters and targets. Targets are things that individual sites study. There's a, a and this is on a, a, a nimble gen capture in the next generation. Uh, sequencing platform. It's currently HiSeq being transformed to, tr transported to MySeq and perhaps Ion Torrent. Um, this is what happens when you interrogate uh, individual subjects and look at how many single nucleotide variants they have. They have around 1,300, around a couple of dozen that are novel and account, uh, around, again, a couple of dozen that are unique. And the problems are that everything works. Um, I'm on top. Everything works. Um, except uh, the two genes that we think are the most important ones. <laughs> and that's CYP2D6, and we're spending a lot of time trying to get CYP2D6 right. Mark knows all about that stuff. Mark, Mark and Mark know all about this stuff. It's, it's problematic because there's dozens of variants, and the, the phenotype that you're interested in, or the genotype you're interested in, are people who have loss of function variants on both alleles. And then there's a second problem that you're interested in, people who have gene duplications. There's a pseudogene right next door, and there's fusions between the pseudogene and the real gene, so it becomes pretty problematic to, to assay. We think there are solutions to that, but it won't be just a plain old next generation run. It'll probably be PCR-based selection of targets and then next generation sequencing the way it looks. We haven't attacked HLA much, but there's some real HLA variants that are of interest, and then I won't talk about this. So the Emerge PGX project grew out of a conversation that Terry and I had about uh, trying to figure out how to use this platform in an implementation space within the electronic medical record. So the notion is develop a list of actionable variants, and you can do that through eMERGE, through CPIC, through whatever you want at an institutional level. Identify the target patients. In a nutshell, most people are using some kind of variation on the Josh Denny algorithm. Come back to that in a second. Resequence on the platform. Identify the actionable variants. There are going to be six or eight or ten of them at the, at right now. And those you stick in the electronic medical record, you deploy the decision support, just like we've done within PREDICT, and then you track outcomes of some sort. And Mark Williams has been working with Josh Peterson on the, on the outcome side of it, but the sorts of outcomes that I've shown you 
are the kinds of outcomes we're going to focus on. And then aim three is to take all the rest of them and make, put them in a repository for somebody to do something with. So this idea I keep on coming back to of a genotype, phenotype uh, repository, this is going to be about 9,000 subjects, so not enough to do very much with, but a start to thinking about how this should be done. We're planning to recruit, this is the important part of this slide, around 8,000 subjects, but if the Air Force wants to contribute another 5,000, we're happy to take them as well. 8,000, right, right. Okay, right. So the initial target drawings are no surprise to most people. These are the, these are the, these are the nine sites within Emerge. The, the top seven are adult sites mostly, and the, top, the bottom three are children's sites mostly. So the children's sites are focused a little bit on different drugs and a little bit different algorithms. But basically, the adult sites are mostly focused on clopidogrel, warfarin, simvastatin, uh, some of the thiopurines, the things that you've heard about already. The subject selection, I've just outlined the ones that are using uh, a, some kind of preemptive selection strategy. Gail Jarvik has also come up with this other strategy where she's going to start to look at patients who have unusual drug responses or unusual genotypes and then try to figure out whether she can get them uh, incorporated into this data set to look at some rare things. Uh, and this is the last slide. Okay, so where we are right this instant is we've collected about 3,000 of the total 9,500. So 9,500 is close to 7,800. The first 300 samples are in process right now. We, we, we want to be able to deliver by the end of the year at least 100 samples from each site. Some sites uh, are able to just go back into the biobank and grab 1,000 samples because they are consented. So other sites have to go and consent people prospectively to do them. So this, the, the, the accruals are going to be different at different sites. Um, we're, we're working on this second part, which is pretty standard and, and it involves the EMR uh, uh, staff at each place. And then the third thing is to, to th think about what this repository would look like. And we're starting to think about that. We're having an eMERGE meeting next week. And one of the things that we've decided to do is to create use cases for what the, you'll hear about this next week, Rex. We'll create use cases for what this repository might look like. So one use case is we're really interested in knowing how many instant thromboses there are among people with clopidogrel. So we're going to collect specific information that will enable those use cases. And another thing to point out is that among the 84 genes are five that are on uh, the ACMG list. There are actually eight, uh, there are actually, sorry, six. There are actually eight. Two of them are, are, are drug metabolism genes. So we sort of, I didn't count those because we're going to be counting those as part of the implementation of the pharmacogenetics part. But these are going to be the ones where there may be incidental findings that we're particularly interested in tracking down. And we'll have the electronic records, so we'll be able to sort of see what the frequency is and what the phenotypes look like along the lines of what Les told you about before. So that's a brief overview of where we are with implementation within eMERGE and, and within PGRN. Great. Thank you, Dan. Questions for Dan? Oh, yes. Les. In general, how are you uh, viewing and handling um, informed consent for this being? I noticed on your order sheet it did make it very clear this is genetic testing, and you had some little boxes f for opting out and those sort of things. So how are you thinking about consent in this context? So um, the, uh, well, let me talk about what we're doing at Vanderbilt, because I think that's sort of the extreme case, and that's that um, uh, the PREDICT project itself, which looks at a very restricted number of pharmacogenes, is viewed as a quality improvement initiative. And, and so we actually tell the patients about it, we hand them a brochure, but there's not an IRB consent form that goes with it. They can say, no, we don't want to do it, and you, of course, wouldn't do it. This, of course, is quite different. So, Dan, could you step by the mic so that uh, you get this? Up. This, of course, is quite different because we're doing, we're doing um, sequencing and we're going to find other stuff. So there's a formal consent process that we have gone through. And we, I, it's IRB approved and, and we have a, a consent form that says this is what's going to happen. Yeah, I just uh, I'm asked because I'm interested in trying to sort of, um, if you will, crank things down a little bit. And my view is I've often felt that the routine pharmacogenetic testing, that is the interrogation for the known variants, is the, the most opposite thing to Huntington's disease testing that there is in genetics, in that this is just trivial. 
And I, well, I really it's, think it's, we can waste a lot of time with a lot of angst about risks and benefits and informed consents and risks right. to relatives. So, so, Who so cares? I, Just we do agree it. With you and we're doing it. We're doing it exactly the way you would want us to do it. So we don't get a, we don't get informed consent to get That's a great. creatinine to adjust the dose of a renally excreted drug. And we sort of look at the pharmacogenomic variants the same way. Um, but obviously, what we're doing within this particular project includes next generation sequencing of genes that you know are on your list, so that they're there. There's a consent. That's process. different. But I think it's great that you guys have this more graded response and thinking about it instead of saying, you know having the deep tendon reflex of right. oh my god this is genetic testing. Well, the problem then becomes if you want to report what you're going to do, then you have to go to the IRB and, and say we're you know now it's not quality improvement only; it's we're looking at a data set. Other comments? Yes, Adam. I'm just curious, I noticed in the uh, data you're going through from the PREDICT study that you had clinical data su decision support fire tw for 24,000 patients, and then you had 6,000 progress to actually ordering. Uh, Have you done any assessments as to why uh, why some of those aren't going through, or is, is yeah, it? Yeah, no, so it we're, we're, one of the things we're struggling with right now is that, when I sh that, that, that EMR thing that says PREDICT test up in the corner, um, not, you know, every time people see it, they look at it and they say, uh, uh, you know, it, it doesn't really require consent, but it still requires a discussion with the patient about what's going to happen. And so in a very, very busy clinical environment, we think, in a very busy clinical environment, we think that that's probably the major reason that people don't want to do it. I, I know that there are patients, for example, that I see, because I'm in a referral environment where the, the, the algorithm will say fire, and yet I will see that, I see that patient once a year and they get all their care at some other hospital. And so it's not useful for us because we really want to follow what happens to these patients. So I don't do it in, in those kinds of environments. So there are all kinds of reasons and we're looking into it, but, but basically there's a, the, the capture rate is small. Great, any other comments? Iftikhar. Uh, just to mention in response to the earlier question that uh, there's a sp site specific variation on the return of incidental findings in the context of this project. And some sites are returning the incidental findings and others are not. That's in part of the informed consent, which varies by site. Great, thank you. So our next presenter will be Terry Manolio, who's gonna talk about. <laughs> <laughs>